Production of this program was made possible in part by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Educational Telecommunications Association. I saw women who were burned taking refuge, and I saw their faces. Their faces were so swollen, they could not open their eyes, and their skin and clothes were stuck together and hanging from their arms. They were very miserable, and their death, a gruesome sight. On August 6, 1946, among the ruins of Hiroshima, survivors of the world's first nuclear war rallied. They carried signs that read, No more war, and peace begins here. Seared by atomic fire, they were reborn as champions of peace. The next year, Mayor Hamai renamed Hiroshima the City of Peace, saying, August 6th should be remembered for having created an opportunity to establish world peace. These terrifying weapons have brought a revolution in our thoughts. As a result, we find new truths and new paths for starting life anew. Let us ban the horror and crime of war and establish true peace. Across the world, the man instrumental in unleashing this atomic power was troubled by his conscience and a grim vision. J. Robert Oppenheimer saw new weapons evolving that made atomic bombs appear puny. He also saw that a commitment to peace was the answer. In his 1953 security clearance hearing, question, you knew dropping that atomic bomb would kill or injure thousands of civilians, is that correct? Answer, not as many as turned out. Question, how many were killed or injured? Answer, 70,000. Question, did you have moral scruples about that? Answer, terrible ones. Question, would you have supported the dropping of a thermonuclear bomb on Hiroshima? Answer, it would make no sense at all. Question, why? Answer, the target is too small. In 1946, nuclear weapons evolved at an astonishing pace. Inspired physics and inventive engineering brought fantastic weapons into reality. The bomb quickly evolved into a sleek, sophisticated weapon. Now, many times the destructive power of World War II could be released in a single afternoon. We, we were never really afraid of anything, except failing. This was a time of emergency orders, as the United States built a formidable nuclear arsenal to stay the threat of communism. These were the years of the Cold War and deterrence, as Eisenhower defined as to be constantly ready to inflict greater loss upon the enemy than he could reasonably hope to inflict on us. The Soviets called it simply terror. Most of us that were working on these things could not imagine them being used. You could only imagine them being such a threat that nobody would go ahead with such a thing. If you went the other route, your mind can't handle it because it's overwhelming to imagine killing millions of people with weapons of this sort. What worried me then and has worried me all through the years is this thing could go either, either way. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were absolutely a defining moment of the 20th century, maybe a defining moment in human history. They made it clear in the most brutal way what this new discovery was about. In nanoseconds, the nature of warfare and how nations would relate to each other was forever changed. 
war had reached its zenith. The following Cold War years were complicated by personalities, ideologies, old fears and new visions. Unlocking the secrets of the universe would be relatively easy compared to finding the formula for peace. It was standing room only for Operation Crossroads, the first non-war related atomic test. Free from the veil of top secrecy, everyone wanted to study this phenomenon. Readied were implosion bombs almost identical to Fat Man dropped on Nagasaki. A fleet of 92 aging World War II warships manned by goats was assembled. The first test able was an air detonation. The target at the center of this guinea pig fleet was the battleship Nevada. Blamed on poor aerodynamics, the bomb missed by almost two miles. It sank only five ships. Detonated underwater, Baker yielded 21 kilotons with spectacular effect. Tossed about like toys, nine ships sank. Crossroads is not significant for its development of atomic weapons. Its real impact lies elsewhere. The awful destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki catalyzed new fears around the world. The Soviets denounced the atomic bombing as a repulsive act of cynical anti-humanism. Stalin proclaimed atomic bombs are meant to frighten those with weak nerves. Finding a strategic balance with the U.S. would now dominate Soviet thinking. Arguments over the control of nuclear weapons broke out. The United States offered a plan to abolish weapons. The Soviets countered with their plan. Around the world, the sincerity of the U.S. plan was doubted. Four days earlier, Operation Crossroads had ended. Stalin's fears were now intensified. The atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki ended one war. Crossroads is significant because it was the beginning of the next. Americans like to think of themselves as well. If anybody has the bomb, we should have it because we know we won't use it except if there's a good reason. Well, unfortunately, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily think the same way about us. And since we're the only nation that ever actually used these terrible things, it's not surprising. So from the Soviet, from the Russian perspective, and the perspective of the Russian scientists, it was a very necessary thing, and they worked just as hard on it as our people, and they did it in the same number of months. I don't see anything incongruous about um, developing weapons and talking peace. And I think the general idea of talking peace is best done from a position of strength, not weakness. Operation Sandstone debuted the United States Atomic Proving Grounds on the Anahuitoc Atoll in the Marshall Islands. Interrogated by the FBI, test personnel were asked to swear they were not communists. To Washington, it was only a matter of time before Soviets had the bomb. This meant only one thing, World War III. At the heart of the communist revolution was the belief that the destruction of the capitalist system was crucial for the development of society. The floods of blood ran high. Lenin gave birth to modern genocide and Stalin followed, taking hammer and sickle to his own people with unprecedented cruelty. Called the Great Terror, one Soviet official estimated Stalin murdered almost 20 million Russians. Summoned to Moscow from the Ukraine, Nikita Khrushchev found life in Stalin's inner circle, quote, an insane asylum, end quote. You know, during the war, the Russian military tactics were essentially not to worry about how many of their soldiers were killed. They would just go in and, you know, in frontal attacks. And I could perfectly well conceive that they would be willing to, you know, have 10 or 20 million of their people killed if they could beat us or get world domination. Those guys were a little bit nuts. Sandstone marked the beginning of weapons evolution. The designs promised a bigger bang, and they delivered. The X-ray test yielded 37 kilotons, and Yoke delivered 49 kilotons. 
The U.S. could see a 75% increase in yield and a 63% increase in the number of bombs produced. Thrilled, Los Alamos director Norris Bradbury spread the good news. David Lilienthal, the chairman of the newly formed Civilian Controlled Atomic Energy Commission, was more sober. He said, I don't object at all that the job is being done well, but that there should not be even a single token expression of profound concern or regret that we are engaged in developing weapons directed against the indiscriminate destruction of defenseless men, women, and children bothered me. The Allied cooperation of World War II ended abruptly in 1948. Soviet forces took control in Czechoslovakia on February the 25th and on June 24th blockaded West Berlin. In June 1950, communist forces attacked South Korea, a shift in strategy from subversion to outright aggression. Expecting the Soviets to join the fight, the U.S. faced a national emergency. Truman said he would take necessary steps to remedy the situation, saying, that includes every weapon we have. Air Force Secretary Stuart Symington added to the already nervous U.S. by saying, in the atomic age, there is no place to hide. In October, the first air raid shelter signs appeared in New York City, and a booklet, Survival Under Atomic Attack, distributed. I remember at Los Alamos, uh, probably early 50s, maybe it was in 46, uh, some of us were advocating, advocating bombing Russia once a month. We had limited stockpile, but we thought, you know, what we got to do was get rid of their industrial capability, and just keep them on their knees. Interesting, the people who, who thought this were people who had ancestry in Czechoslovakia or Hungary uh, the border uh, to the Soviet Union. The most significant atomic test to advance U.S. nuclear weapons took place in northeastern Kazakhstan. The Soviets Joe one sent shockwaves that reached to Washington. They not only were on equal footing with the U.S., but they had something far more important, the thermonuclear trigger. Edward Teller would get his chance to build the bomb he dreamed of. The Russians had a big army on the ground in Europe, and we had the bomb. And then one day we woke up, and the Russians had a big army on the ground in Europe and the bomb. That's why there was so much panic in Washington. What shall we do? What shall we do? We had had a weapon that was a clear and decisive advantage over anyone else. And suddenly, there were two. The thing that always impressed me about the Soviet work was how they were able to accomplish all that they did, considering the mess their country was in at the end of the war, the devastation. And it just, that, that has always amazed me. Arrogant, intellectual, and persuasive, chairman of the General Advisory Committee to the Atomic Energy Commission, Oppenheimer was concerned how the H-bomb caught the imagination of Congress and the military. Immensely influential, he thoroughly angered those who were bent on countering the communist threat. He felt that the H-bomb created a peace, quote, full of dangers, end quote. Other members agreed, Enrico Fermi and I. I. Raby said, it cannot be confined to a military objective, but becomes a weapon which, in practical effect, is almost one of genocide. A desirable peace cannot come from such an inhuman application of force. It is an evil thing considered in any light. As far as I was concerned, if it could be done, it would be done. Uh, and there was just no, I had no understanding of the rationale who people who said no, because uh, they had clearly no control of what anybody else could do. And we clearly were still concerned with the Russians very much in the Cold War. And it was clear that if, if this were a technical possibility, it would be the next step. 
And so I, I just didn't understand why people opposed this. Not even on a moral or ethical ground? What? I don't understand uh, this moral or ethical. People shoot each other with bullets. Armies kill each other with bullets, with flamethrowers. I, I see no difference in, uh, you know, it's just you do more uh, at one time. I think the war is morally wrong. Any killing anybody is wrong. Truman made the final call. He agreed with the Joint Chiefs and gave the go-ahead, saying, we've got to have it for bargaining purposes with the Russians. But from Truman's point of view, I don't think it took him five minutes to make up his mind. The military said, we need it, we need it, boom. I didn't play poker, I'm, I'm, I'm too tight to, I can't stand losing anything, money or any competition or a game or anything. I didn't play poker. I don't like bluffing, which you have to be able to do if you are a successful poker player. In the Pacific, the quest for a super bomb began. Very hush-hush, Greenhouse was to be the first thermonuclear reaction on Earth. With top physicists in attendance, it was also the site of remarkable poker games. Despite its impressive energy, fission had limits, but fusion, the power of the stars, offered unlimited power. It was the prize. In 1941, Enrico Fermi saw how an atomic bomb could create heat equal to the sun and fuse hydrogen atoms, resulting, quote, in a colossal release of energy, end quote. Fermi determined one gram of deuterium converted to helium was 100 million times more powerful than a gram of chemical explosive, and eight times stronger than uranium-235. In the George test, a cylinder held a fraction of an ounce of deuterium and tritium, isotopes of hydrogen. They were held away from the center of an atomic blast to study the effects of X-ray radiation. Tests had shown an atomic bomb produces radiation densities many times heavier than lead and attains stellar heat Two hundred kilotons were from fission. The remaining 25, more than the Hiroshima blast, was from less than an ounce of deuterium and tritium. Item tested fusion boosting. A small amount of deuterium and tritium was placed in the core of an atomic bomb and doubled item's yield. The results of Greenhouse gave a new optimism to creating the super. An elated teller confided to an observer that Anna Wetok would not be big enough for the next test. Oppenheimer had concerns about the H-bomb being our salvation. In a letter to Niels Bohr, he wrote, it may seem curious to you that we in this country have been so slow to recognize where lay our true hope and our great danger. I have not despaired that we shall yet have learned in time. I don't have any trouble identifying with him at all. Ad identifying with his feelings. I believe him. I mean, I can easily see what he's thinking about when he said, you know, I have become death the destroyer of worlds. There's also the remark he made later in which he said in some sense that no humor, no understatement can cover up the physicists have known sin. I'm not at all surprised with those statements. When I say things like that myself, I say them rather differently. The position I finally came to when I was working for Eisenhower is that maintaining peace through the threat of mutual suicide is just not an acceptable way to uh, go on into the future. Although striking progress was made in fission bombs, there was a great pessimism about building the super. Creating a thermonuclear fusion reaction required setting off an atomic bomb. Studying this process had its difficulties. Mathematical calculations of unprecedented complexity were substituted. Bradbury was less than enthusiastic since a workable design was unrealized. Los Alamos resources might as well be put into further development of fission weapons. Early on, all Edward Teller could offer was his tenacity. His biggest contribution was, first of all, pressing, pressing, pressing. 
he was the person out in front insisting that this had to be done and he was the person expressing the technological optimism that said, you know, if we try, we can do it. Working intensely on the astronomical calculations, Stanislaw Ulam saw a magnitude of problems. To help, the human calculator, Johnny von Neumann, and the University of Princeton created the world's first computer. Its job, to help create the hydrogen bomb. One of the problems was Edward, Edward Teller. We used to say he, he had the bomb of the week. After promising designs, Teller was stumped. He knew it and so did everyone else. Ulam, working hard on using one fission bomb to implode on another for efficiency, had a breakthrough. His wife, Francoise, describes coming into the room at their house and seeing him staring out the window into the garden. And he turned to her and said, I've figured out a way to make it work. She said, what work? And he said, it's a really different scheme and it will change the course of history. Capitalizing on Ulam's idea, plus the experiments at Greenhouse, Teller seized upon a workable design. Radiation implosion would be the answer. Bradbury gave authority to those who could get the job done. Teller would not be in charge of building the super. Frustrated, resentful, Teller left Los Alamos. Soon he would work with E.O. Lawrence to start a second weapons lab, the University of California Radiation Laboratory in Berkeley. You have a love-hate relationship with Teller. You, some days you think he's the greatest guy in the world, and the next day you really think he's a demon. The push to build up a stockpile accelerated weapons testing. Buster Jangle inaugurated the model for tests in Nevada. The Department of Defense conducted weapons effects, while Los Alamos conducted weapons experiments. Tests centered on fission refinements and important fusion designs. As the Korean conflict escalated, testing in Nevada became almost nonstop. It's fractions of a microsecond. Now you have to understand it to say, if the radiation flows from a primary down the area around the fuel and everything else instantaneously, how long does it take to do it? Do I need to contain it? Or is it just the instant impact of that radiation? Oh, that's a real good question. Our initial reactions were he needed to bottle it up long enough for it to work. The mic test of Operation Ivy was the first attempt at a thermonuclear detonation. Yields would now be measured in millions of tons of TNT. Mike was more of a scientific oddity than its atomic ancestor, Trinity. It looked like a great big railroad tank car standing on end. A radio signal from the USS Estes leapt 30 miles across the ocean to fire 92 detonators inserted into the high explosives of Mike's fission primary. As each detonator fired with microsecond simultaneity, an explosive wave formed. It drove inward to compress the plutonium core and the atomic blast ensued. Moving millions of a second ahead of the fission fireball, hotter than the center of the sun, dense X-ray radiation flooded radiation channels and instantly converted the polyethylene lining into a plasma. The plasma pushed the X-rays inwards. The uranium tamper surrounding the liquid deuterium instantly melted and pushed into the deuterium, heating it to fusion temperatures. Reacting to this tremendous heat and compression was a plutonium rod at the center of the deuterium. It imploded compressing and heating the deuterium from within. experiments in modern history was a success. 
Man had seized upon the power of the stars, released it on Earth, huge thermonuclear fireball created every element known in the universe. The explosion was unprecedented, 10.4 megatons. Observers were stunned. A sailor wrote home saying, Mike rose over the horizon like a dark sun. It was absolutely fantastic, spectacular, and scary. The scary part was the heat which just stayed on. It didn't go, we got hotter and hotter. We were about 25 miles away. It really got hot and you kept worrying, was the heat ever gonna be turned off? It, you had to keep telling yourself, my God, I, I, I'm 20 some miles away. And yet it, it's right here. And it seemed to be growing and growing and growing. The mushroom cloud skyrocketed. In 90 seconds, it reached 57,000 feet. In two and a half minutes, it passed 100,000 feet. After five minutes, the cloud crested at 27 miles. Its stem measured eight miles across, and the top billowed over 100 miles. It was about 1,000 times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And then we were all very happy, very elated, successful. And then all we wanted to do is come home right away. Let's get home, we'll start doing something else. There were the obvious thoughts of, uh, well, you know, we, I calculated it right, or it's, we did it, we're, we're ahead of the Russians, and the, otherwise, well, it's a, you know, it's, on the other hand, it's a great pity it didn't turn out to be impossible, so that, you know, so you couldn't have weapons this big. As time goes on, I'm afraid more and more people in government and positions of authority really won't appreciate the magnitude of the potential devastation that our present nuclear weapons can inflict on, on any country or any city. And I think the only way that you can really sort of burn this into their minds is by having them witness a large yield thermonuclear weapon. The heat, I think, will really make true believers out of them that uh, war is not the answer to any dispute. What's important about, about all of these nuclear weapons is not how they look. They look spectacular. Whenever you go to a proving ground or a test ground, it's always done in a, in a way so as to guarantee that it will be safe. You see the spectacle, but you suffer no pain. So it's pictures of Hiroshima that give you, that tell you what these bombs are like. People ran to the river seeking water, but in the water there were many bodies floating. There were dead or injured people lying everywhere. It was like hell. The destruction of the city was so shocking that I cannot express it with words. Hiroshima unveiled a peace park. The people of Hiroshima firmly believed the roots of peace could be found here. The park's centerpiece is the cenotaph. Inscribed on it is, please rest peacefully, for we will not repeat the evil. It is sad for me to tell my story but I think that I have to share my experience with as many people as possible to prevent nuclear war. So I am pleased I have this opportunity to speak. J. Robert Oppenheimer no longer had access, RSA, in the nation's nuclear secrets. Tortured over weeks of testimony, which included an unsupportive teller, the committee revoked his security clearance due to Oppenheimer's early communist associations. 
The architect of the hearing was the ultra-conservative head of the AEC, Louis Strauss. Strauss would not tolerate Oppie, whom he thought a spy. Senator Joseph McCarthy congratulated Strauss, saying Oppenheimer's suspension was long overdue. A realist and no pacifist, Oppenheimer saw the short-term need to build more bombs. Yet the self-confessed destroyer of worlds was undergoing a revolution of thought. Oppenheimer had conquered science. Now he was conquering his conscience. He understood the answer to the equation of war and modern technology. Ironically, Oppenheimer's dismissal occurred as new voices sought a way out of the growing nuclear arms race. In his final State of the Union address of 1953, Truman warned, quote, the war of the future could extinguish millions of lives at one blow and destroy the very structure of a civilization. Such a war is not possible policy for rational men, end quote. Taking the arms race to the next dramatic step, the Soviets exploded their first hydrogen bomb in August 1953. The Eisenhower administration met the Soviet threat. We must be ready to dare all for our country. Weapons production reached unparalleled success. Eisenhower wanted to inform a wary world that the U.S. was also interested in peace. Increasingly, he saw it his duty to inform Americans of the consequences of nuclear war and felt everyone would support arms control if they understood the danger. In his pivotal Adams for Peace speech, he wanted to set a new tone for the U.S. and the world. The United States pledges before you, and therefore before the world, its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. Thank you. Appointed first secretary soon after Stalin's death on March 5, 1953, Nikita Khrushchev was briefed on the grim facts of thermonuclear warfare. He said, I couldn't sleep for several days. When I became convinced that we could never possibly use these weapons, I was able to sleep again. In February 1956, the 20th Party Congress convened. It was momentous. Bravely, Khrushchev unveiled Stalin's brutality and began changing the belief that war with a capitalist was inevitable. Anyone wielding an H-bomb demanded respect. Khrushchev declared Soviets faced either peaceful coexistence or the most destructive war in history. There is no third way. Khrushchev was a pretty good man to have in that position at that time because he had, you know, he was in charge of the battle in the Ukraine, Kiev, he was in charge of Stalingrad. He knew what war was about. If atomic weapons weren't enough, the advent of thermonuclear bombs revolutionized everyone's thinking. Well, that's one good thing about nuclear weapons because in the first time in history, the people who make these decisions are as much at risk as the poor soldiers that they used to send off to go fight their war. Despite these remarkable events, Khrushchev and Eisenhower vigorously pursued more sophisticated nuclear weapons. Each felt any show of weakness, and the other would take advantage of it. Eisenhower's Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, drew up a fearful doctrine of massive retaliation. Deterrence was still the weapon of choice for waging peace. On Bikini, Operation Castle used an innovative dry fuel, lithium deuteride, which made castle bombs lighter and smaller. The first test, Bravo, weighed only 23,500 pounds, with a planned yield of about five megatons. In the early morning hours of March 1st, Bravo redefined thermonuclear weapons. The fireball grew beyond what anyone expected.
Well, I had this feeling it was a, a great diseased brain. Who knows, I'd contributed, maybe it was my brain. It looked like an evil, all-powerful thing which had connotations of the brain, maybe, as you know, too much science that was going to destroy us all. Bravo was a runaway at 30 miles out. What Jack Seaman and the bridge crew of the USS Barocco saw was unimaginable. Recovering from the supernova flash, they stood in silence. They stared in awe and horror as a thick black and orange cloud roared across the ocean, dropping bright red fire. The quiet of the bridge was broken by a prayer heard over a radio. It was from the pilot of an observation plane who had just witnessed the mushroom cloud shoot past his altitude of 40,000 feet. Bob Fitton on the USS Phillips said it was a religious experience personal view of the apocalypse. And the reason it went high is that we had wrong cross-sections for the lithium. We, we didn't know that there was an N2N -N reaction on lithium-7. Just didn't know it. Equal to about 1,000 Hiroshima bombs, Bravo was our most powerful test, yielding an extraordinary 15 megatons. All the explosives used in World War II totaled only two megatons. Changing wind patterns and the surprisingly high yield spread fallout over 50,000 square miles. Marshallese Islanders, thought to be safe, received substantial exposure before evacuated. Fishing within the expanded fallout area, 23 members of the Japanese fishing vessel, the Lucky Dragon, were dusted with a strange white ash for nearly three hours. The crew returned home, traveling for two weeks with it on board. Arriving sick with the radiation poisoning, a national outrage began. Sadly, on September 23rd, Kumanai Kichi Kubuyama died of complications. His funeral was attended by over 400,000 people. Later, over 30 million Japanese, almost one third of the entire population, signed a petition to ban nuclear weapons testing. The Lucky Dragon was enshrined in a Tokyo park. In the park, a stone monument is inscribed with Kubuyama's last words. They read, please make sure that I am the last victim of the bomb. I'm not very sympathetic toward them today even. I had a lot of my classmates who were killed in the Pacific Theater. And of course, uh, the War Department during that time showed some of the atrocities that the Japanese had committed. They, they, weren't, they didn't play by the rules. And so whatever, I've always resented this Hiroshima business that they celebrate every year. But this is 10 years later. This is the... Doesn't matter to me. I, I'm Irish. I, I don't forgive or forget. Initially, individuals, including Linus Pauling, Bertrand Russell, Norman Cousins, and citizen organizations, were considered by the administration to be the dupes of communist agents. The door to the White House was closed to them. AEC Chairman Louis Straws later believed otherwise, yet still considered dissenters to be hypocrites and naive. Soon public concern became critical. Fears of radioactivity poisoning the atmosphere were widespread, and civil defense held little public confidence. Uh, in 1960, in New York City, uh, a group of mothers took charge of the protests against nuclear testing in City Hall Park. And some uh, 1,000 uh, turned out that year, uh, wheeling baby carriages and uh, protesting against nu nuclear testing and refusing to take shelter. Uh, this proved to be the largest civil disobedience action in American history up to that time. Uh, the following year, some 2,500 turned out for the demonstration. 
even though we we uh, we stumbled and fell and and what have you early on by the time we got an operational capability we were ahead of them we had much better accuracy didn't have the throw weight and and quite the yield that they had opted for but it didn't matter I mean you can only you can only kill a city so dead. With Russia wielding the H-bomb, there was no holding back. From 1955 through 1958, the stable U.S. nuclear weapons infrastructure pushed aggressively ahead. About every way that we could weaponize a nuclear device uh, that could then be converted into a nuclear weapon uh, was tried. It was very scary. I mean, I mean, the buildup certainly went to numbers that were absurdly higher than was necessary for deterrence. Because the Soviets were churning out missiles like sausages, as Khrushchev bluffed, Eisenhower worried the U.S. fell behind the Soviets in missile technology. A missile gap mentality spurred on a tremendous effort in missile delivery systems, along with developing compact, light, spherical implosion devices. Operation Red Wing's Dakota device weighed only 1,797 pounds and delivered a 1.1 megaton punch. Emphasis also turned to defensive warheads for air-to-air -air and ground-to-air missiles. Weapons designers were perfecting their art. In the ultimate application, that is an intercontinental ballistic missile, you're only like 30 minutes from anywhere in the world. So you've got the element of surprise. If for some reason that you didn't want to continue the war, bombers could be called back. That was an advantage for aircraft, but a disadvantage for the missiles. I mean, once you launched them, you were committed. By 1957, U.S. nuclear weapons facilities operated at peak efficiency. With the moratorium being discussed, weapons labs rushed as many devices as possible to the test range. Operation Plum Bob performed 30 component-related tests in Nevada. Operation Hardtack-1 held 35 tests in the Pacific to develop missiles to strike deep into the heart of Russia. Tests centered on intercontinental ballistic missile and submarine-launched ballistic missile warheads and high-altitude multi-megaton tests to study anti-ballistic missile defenses. The UCRL Juniper device of the W-47 Polaris warhead was a design breakthrough. A 65 kiloton yield was produced from a device measuring a diameter of 14 inches, a length of 15 inches, and weighed only 165 pounds. In Nevada, Hardtech 2 performed 37 low-yield component tests held underground to reduce fallout. In his second term, Eisenhower sought to gain control of the U.S. buildup. In 1970, York wrote about the struggle Eisenhower faced trying to alter the course of an apparent race to oblivion. York said, the hard cell technologists invented the term missile gap and they embellished that simple phrase with ornate horror stories about imminent threats to our very existence as a nation. They then promptly offered a thousand and one technical delights. Anyone who did not immediately agree with their assessments of the situation and who failed to recognize the necessity of proceeding forthwith on the development and production of their solutions was said to be unable to understand the situation 
and tried to put the budget ahead of survival. It seemed as if the pursuit of expensive and complicated technology as an end in itself might very well become an accepted part of America's way of life. During the test moratorium at the end of the Eisenhower administration, we were talking about whether, the, whether or not the Russians were cheating. And I said, in my judgment, there's no evidence that the Russians were testing. John McCone says, that's treason. Every one of the national leaders at some point woke up and said to himself, we can't use these things. If you track the defense budgets over the Cold War for both the Russian side and our side, you will see that they, for, for nuclear weapons, you'll see that they go up and down, not in coordination with conflict and confrontation, but in coordination with pump priming, with economic policy putting some bucks into the economy so people have jobs. So they knew. And I think that's very serious, because they risked our lives. Eisenhower and Khrushchev made on-again, off-again commitments to a moratorium on testing, creating a real optimism to both sides. Eisenhower invited Khrushchev to the US Arriving in September 1959, the visit was a success. Eisenhower promised a visit to Russia after the Paris summit in June of next year. There were now real hopes of the US and Soviets signing a treaty that would ban testing. On May 1st, 1960, Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane was shot down over Russia. Khrushchev demanded an apology. Eisenhower had none to give. The summit failed. The visit canceled. The thaw evaporated. The Cold War advanced. Frustrated, Khrushchev felt the US only understood strength. He ended the moratorium with an unprecedented test series, including a colossal 50 megaton bomb. JFK inherited the failed Eisenhower-Khrushchev negotiations and reluctantly responded with Operation Nougat. Due to fallout, 32 low-yield tests were held mostly underground in Nevada. Operation Dominic in Fishbowl included 36 high-altitude, high-yield tests in the Pacific. Thor missiles were detonated at high altitudes to evaluate high-yield explosions against incoming ballistic missiles. In Nevada, 56 tests of Operation Storax were rapidly conducted and included the last U.S. above-ground tests. The people of Hiroshima were astounded by the eagerness of both countries creating and testing more and more weapons. Hiroshima Mayor Hamai wrote both leaders for an end to the escalation, fearing the worst. That particular time was a damn crazy time. During the NATO years, we had our weapons on German aircraft, Dutch aircraft, British aircraft, Italian aircraft, everybody was in the act. Russia was surrounded. I, I, and then we, of course, put in the Jupiters, Thors, and Atlases in Turkey and Italy and the UK. By fall 1962, Khrushchev had secretly placed nuclear missiles in Cuba, seeking balance. He thought, quote, it was high time the Americans learned what it feels like to have our own land and our own people threatened, end quote. Within an 1,100-mile range, the missiles could reach 92 million Americans. Estimates showed that more than half would die. Anguished as to the next step, President Kennedy fought a unanimous Joint Chiefs bent on a military strike, a step he felt could plunge the world into a nuclear nightmare. Kennedy set up a naval blockade. 
1,400 nuclear bombers went on 24-hour alert, and troops were ready. For 13 days, the world was on the edge of the unthinkable. Kennedy proposed a secret deal to Khrushchev. The U.S. would not invade Cuba at any time and would quietly remove missiles from Turkey. The tension was unbearable. Khrushchev was reduced to basic instincts. He trusted Kennedy and removed the missiles. Khrushchev grandstanded, saying, in order to save the world, we must retreat. Even at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Soviet Union did not go to full nuclear alert, knowing that Curtis LeMay had everything we had in the air ready to, ready to drop it on, on his country if they so much as squeaked. So good nerves, good nerves at the height of the crisis when he was willing to suffer humiliation and eventually lose his position in power by retreating rather than risk nuclear war. We had good leaders on both sides during that crisis. But history and our own conscience will judge us harshly if we do not now make every effort to test our hopes by action. And this is the place to begin. My fellow Americans, let us take that first step. Let us, if we can, step back from the shadows of war and seek out the way of peace. And if that journey is a thousand miles or even more, let history record that we, in this land, at this time, took the first step. The evolving weapon, national defense strategies, public opinion, the complex and unorthodox equation for peace was coming together. After having the world on the edge of nuclear Armageddon, a test ban treaty was finalized in Moscow on August 5th, 1963, quote, of unlimited duration, end quote. It banned testing in the atmosphere, underwater, and in outer space. Its origins lay in the great concern that radioactive fallout was poisoning Earth. The treaty did not ban underground testing. I got to look at their SS-25s and their SS-20, which are both mobile missiles. I tell you, they're, they're horrible. There's no way we could stop or control those. It was a real breakthrough. There had never been uh, any respite from this notion that um, one's nation was more uh, secure uh, if one developed more nuclear weapons and more dangerous nuclear weapons. And now, finally, there was a breakthrough toward arms control and toward peace. Honored with the AEC's Enrico Fermi Award, J. Robert Oppenheimer was still denied a security clearance. Receiving the award by newly appointed President Johnson, he responded, I think it is just possible, Mr. President, that it has taken some charity and some courage for you to make this award today. That would seem to me a good augury for all our futures. Oppenheimer soon died of cancer. Those close to him say he died of a broken heart. The basic dilemma of the 50s and 60s was that uh, we were building up our power, our ability to project power and force and to do harm to others was steadily increasing, and yet our national security was steadily decreasing, as measured by the simple fact that other people were able to do greater damage to us year by year, greater and greater. Uh, I was one of a group of people who became convinced uh, that uh, there was no technical solution. I reached that conclusion you know, on my own. I, I wasn't the only one who reached it. And I still feel the same. That's the, that's the fundamental problem with national missile defense. It's not that there's anything morally reprehensible about trying to defend yourself. In fact, if, if we really knew how to do it, I would support the idea. But it's reaching for a technical solution to a, what is really a political problem. I think the nuclear weapons have prevented war between the major powers. There's no question 
that with the formation of NATO, the backbone of NATO in the early days was our nuclear weapons in Europe. And that stopped the Soviet aggression, which if it had continued, somebody was going to have to stand up and there would have been a conventional war again. Well, the actions of all these presidents, the, the way in which they were successfully able to live with the dilemma without having to actually resolve it, because they couldn't resolve it, has bought us time. And if we're wise enough, we will use it to, to find a, a permanent solution. War really had been possible because of a kind of prejudice, the belief that there was a limited amount of energy in the world to turn into high explosives and that you could accumulate more than your neighbor and therefore prevail. With the discovery of how to release essentially unlimited energy, matter is all energy, that changed the equation. So the prejudice, to call it that, that it was possible to prevail in war, was no longer true. It was no longer possible to prevail in war. And that changed everything. After all, our common purpose should be, as always, a just, universal, and enduring peace. We kept on getting instructions to keep building this thing, and then this thing, and then this thing. Eventually, the answer was, hey, we've kept something bad from happening for many years. But none of us ever expected it would be that long. We've done our job. We've maintained the peace for a long time. So what's going to work? I don't know what's going to work. I've, I'm 80 now, so <laughs> it's up to you young Turks to figure it out. <laughs>